Welcome to Lumix Festival 2020. For 10 day now, days now, we focus on 10 different topics every day. Today, we want to talk about the storytellers of the future together with Fred Richin, whom I welcome very much. This, the storytellers of the future, are an important topic because now, more than ever, we need approaches that know how to reflect on the billions of images that are already available to set their own work against that. But before we actually begin to discuss and to listen to Fred Richin, just bear me a few seconds, bear with me a few seconds, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit how this is going to work. We disabled the audio for all of you, because usually it gives kinds of kind of problems um, if all the mics are on. But of course, you're welcome very much to interact. And please use the chat box for that to write in all your questions and comments. And please start to write in all the things that come to your mind already at the beginning. We try to curate them and to include them into the discussion later on. And if you like to have a chat, just write into the chat box from where you are following us, which is also interesting to know of us, of course. But now let's start. It is a delight for me to be introducing Fred Richin here as a part of the Digital Lumix Festival. When I read Fred Richin's book, Bending the Frame for the first time, I was fascinated about his idea of the meta photographer. The meta photographer is the photographer realizing that being there should be only the starting point and therefore looking for a greater rhetorical conception of his pictures. For me, this idea might answer questions how visual journalists must re-examine and continue to develop their forms of presentation and how the visual journalism of the future must develop in order to become socially, culturally, and politically effective. Fred is the author of In Our Own Image, The Coming Revolution in Photography. He also wrote After Photography, published in 2009, and Bending the Frame, Photojournalism, Documentary, and the Citizen in 2013. He began writing on digital imaging already in 1984, for the New York Times Magazine, where he also worked as a picture editor. Richin is co-founder of Pixel Press, an organization dedicated to creating, media, to creating new forms of media and advancing human rights. He was professor of photography and imaging at New York's University Tisch School of the Arts. He was founding director director of the photojournalism and documentary program at the ICP in New York. Today, he teaches photography, social justice, and human rights. So please give a warm virtual welcome to Fred Richin now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to actually share the screen since I can't see, see anybody. Um, so I'll start with that. Okay, so thank you to Karen and to, to everybody who organized this. It's a pleasure to be with you, even virtually from the Bronx in New York City. So I just wanna say a few things to start and then show you some images because I think there's quite a bit of confusion as to what photography does, what journalism does and so on. So just to begin, all photography is interpretive, including when it's used journalistically. As a visual journalist, one must try to be fair in depicting people and events without the presumption that one can ever be objective. Objective is impossible, but we should all strive to be as fair as possible. One also has to be aware that one's images will need to be contextualized and one should do one's best to provide that contextualization as accurately and informatively as possible. To do that, you need to know as much as possible about what you are witnessing. You can't just carry a camera and point it. 
I think we also have to change the language that we're using when describing what we do as a photographer. We cannot anymore say that we're shooters, that we're shooting, that we're taking photographs. These are quite aggressive terms. And to me, they don't make sense. I think it's preferable to say that we make photographs. We collaborate on making photographs. For example, not I took his portrait, but I collaborated with my subject to make their portrait. I think it's also important to realize that much of what we do is to show the symptoms, the signifiers of a situation, but not the underlying systems. And I think that has to change. It's too easy to show people with white masks and say virus, or it's too easy just to show demonstrations without showing the causes why people are demonstrating and what we can do about it. I think also we have to photograph what does work, not just what does not work. We need positive examples. We have plenty of negative ones. The spectacle of showing the disaster is very seductive, but I think it's incumbent upon us, us we're responsible simultaneously to show what works in order to create models, to create ideas of what we could do better not just to show us in a kind of unending apocalypse. With that in mind, I think it's also important that photography not just be reactive, reacting to situations and events, but I think it has to be also proactive. In other words, trying to do things before the disaster to minimize the disaster or maybe even to prevent it. It's what I call doing peace photography as opposed to war photography. There's thousands of books of war photography and there are very, very few books of peace photography. I think one also has to judge one's work on its impact on the world. I often ask photographers, what's the impact of your work? And they often say, I never thought about it. I think it's more important to judge the work on its impact on the world. Does it change anything for the better? instead of whether it wins a prize at a competition or a festival. In other words, does it please other photographers, I think is less of an issue than does it change the world for the better. I think we also have to realize that photography is rather slow in evolving. I think it's maybe the possibly the only uh, strategy, the only medium that you could still do what was done in the 1930s and expect to be winning the grand prize. For example, I think Robert Kappa from the 1930s could still easily win the World Press Photo Award in 2021, for example, because I think we haven't asked enough about the st visual strategies that we use and whether they can and need to be changed. And speaking of Kappa, he's famous among many things for his statement, if your pictures aren't good enough, you aren't close enough. And I would suggest that maybe the opposite true is true. If your pictures aren't good enough, maybe you need to be further away. Maybe you need some distance in order to actually see what's happening instead of just responding, as I said before, to the symptoms of what's out there. So beginning with imagery, this is probably the most powerful, important, change-making video in recent memory, eight minutes and 46 seconds of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis by a policeman. I think that one of the questions for professionals is with so many people with cell phones, billions of people with cell phone cameras in the world, often they're the people witnessing events from close up when the professionals can't be everywhere. There's you know thousands or millions of times more amateurs at this point with cell phone cameras than professionals. So I think one of the questions then is, 
what does the professional do that the amateur with a cell phone might not be able to do or might not have the time and energy to do? So I turn to this. This is a book I wrote the preface in 2010. The photographer's originally from Venezuela called In the Shadow of Power. And when I wrote the preface 10 year, it published 10 years ago by an Italian book publishing company about something happening in the US, I realized that with a budget of $3 trillion in Washington DC for the US government, the people living in the city itself had an average life expectancy, a median life expectancy of 72 years, which would rank them at that time as 100, if they were a country, as 120th in the world. That would have put them at that time 14 places behind the Gaza Strip, 18 places behind Venezuela, where the photographer comes from, and 50 places behind Mexico. So obviously, there are issues of racism, there's issues of class, there's issues of oppression that have been going on for a long time. And so last week I looked up Washington DC again, just to see what happened since 2010 in terms of the life expectancy. And to my surprise, according to a survey done two years ago, the average life expectancy for people living in the neighborhood Southeast Washington and Acostia was 67 years, five years less than before, putting them, if they were a country, somewhere around 140th in the world, equivalent to Myanmar. But then I looked in Northwest Washington, in Georgetown, the average life expectancy was 94. So that means that in the same city, there's a difference in life expectancy of 27 years between one neighborhood and another neighborhood. It's obviously intolerable. It's, it, it's obviously an infrastructure in healthcare and education and police systems and so on that, that, that cannot continue. And I think these are situations that the professional needs to look at and change and motivate towards change. So the talk I'm giving now is really about how people have done that in the past, how it can be done differently now, and with an emphasis on the idea that in the digital revolution, we have to do things differently. We can't always do it the same way. In the Vietnam War, there were many, many, many pictures of horror that were published in many publications on television and so on. But in 1969, Life Magazine had the idea simply to run the photographs of the American soldiers who died in that one week. There were 242 that one week. And these were only identity photographs of the soldiers. They're not done you know, by a photojournalist on the scene in Vietnam. They're simple identity photograph of these people that with their name, their age, their rank, where they came from. And when they published these images, Life Magazine in 1969 was viewed by many, many people as having turned against the Vietnam War at that point. It wasn't all the images of horror that made people think they turned against the war, but it was simply the images, the, the simple images of people's next door neighbors, family members that made people think they had turned against the war in Vietnam. So the argument is that it's not always the most bloody image, the most spectacular image that can be effective in terms of making us rethink what's going on. John Berger, the English critic, wrote about this photograph from the Vietnam War, and he wondered why the London Times editorial page could support the war when they published an image like this. And in an essay he wrote, that maybe the best idea for a photographer is to photograph for the people in the pictures, not for the outside world in order to avoid spectacle. Maybe by making a family album for the people in the pictures is the most effective way of making images about what's actually happening and not turning it into spectacle. 
1943, Life magazine wanted to talk about the American soldiers who had died in World War II in the middle of the war. It was 18 months. And I believe it was they published the names of 12,987 American soldiers who had died. And in it, they wrote, we have to ask the question, you the reader have to decide, did these people die for something important or for nothing? Did they, they die for something important like the American Revolution in, in the 18th century? Or did they die for something not important as they considered at that time World War I? They were not allowed to, photo, to show photographs of dead soldiers, but they did show this image uh, in Tunisia of an American soldier being buried by six of his comrades. Interestingly enough, George Bush Sr. Uh, banned photographs of coffins of American soldiers returning from the war in Iraq because he didn't want to hurt the morale of the American people. And supposedly there was an issue of privacy, but already in 1943, they were being published. Later, two months later, this was the first image of American dead in World War II, shown so you cannot see their faces which is considered to be incredibly important in the country that it was, they didn't want to publish it at first, the US government had to approve it because they thought it would be bad for morale. But it turns out people needed to see, wanted to see what was happening. So this is what it looked like in 1943. This is what it looks at a few weeks ago, the front page of the New York Times, where similarly what they did both in the two examples I just showed you, but without using photographs, they showed 1,000 of approximately 100,000 Americans at that time who had died of the COVID-19 virus. And in it, they ran the person's name and they said something important about them. You know, he was a great dancer. She, she was a bird watcher. She was a great grandmother, you know, whatever it would be. And I thought that was interesting because in a way, in the image war in which we're in now, in which people use imagery, and they're often not credible at this point, they're often manipulated, you don't know the source, um, there's so many of them, you know, trillions go online every day, uh, billions go online every day. The New York Times felt, for, I'm sure for many reasons, but one was it would be more respectful in some ways not to show the photographs, but to do it this way. So it changed. Interestingly, uh, a former student of mine sent me this the other day. This is online. This is the faces. They are showing the faces of people who died of the COVID virus. Many, 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 many faces that are demographically correct in terms of number of women, older people, black people, Asian people, brown people, and so on, white people. And you can look at all these images and it's actually quite moving. But interestingly enough, none of these people ever existed. They were all generated by a computer and they were curated to provide a demographically accurate view of the actual victims by ace, rage, age, race, and gender. And the person who did this asked us to try to suspend our disbelief and consider the real person symbolized by each one. So again, I think photography is evolving into a place where people can feel it's more respectful to show just the names as the New York Times did, or in this case, imagery of people who never existed, but represent the people who existed, their faces not shown. This is a project I've worked with Anton Kusters, the Belgian photographer. Again, it's an issue of how do you show things to make people feel it to have an impact? These are 1,078 blue skies over World War II concentration camps. And these are, he made three Polaroids in each place, only a blue skies, and then he exhibits it, the 1,078. There's a soundtrack that goes from 1933 to 45, so it's about 12 or 13 years. And every time you hear a beep on the soundtrack, you know that somebody died at that period and the pitch of it changes according to the concentration camp in which the person died. This is the map of the concentration camps, the one 
the, the bigger circles, the dark circles, are the actual extermination camps. But again, this is a choice to say we've seen so many images of people dying. People don't pay attention. People don't know what the Holocaust was. So maybe we have to try something different so that you look at a blue sky and you think of what happened under it. Concentration camps, refugees, Syrian refugees leaving in boats, massacres, police brutality, so that by being indirect, the idea is the reader could use their imagination and imagine it when there's so much dispute over photographs, their meaning, who made them, and whether or not they're authentic. So a Swiss newspaper ran all 1,078 of the images on all these pages, um, which I think is interesting because I think what we as a community of photographers have to do is try to think of different ways that we could show what's going on, not always the same ways, because we get saturated by the same times, kinds of imagery. We defend against it, we stop seeing it, we stop feeling it, and maybe there are other ways to think about things. In 1924, in Friedrich in Germany, had the idea that if he could only show the horror of World War I, we would never have war again. In the book, War Against War, which was published in seven languages, there's still a museum in, in Berlin dedicated to this work. Obviously it didn't work, but again, this was somebody who thought that if you show pictures in certain ways, you may have an impact in the world. You may do something in the world. He was a pacifist. He thought it was horrible. You know, to me, this is one of the most important attempts uh, ever made and uh, inspirational in many ways of what he was trying to do, collecting photographs of the dead, the wounded, the horrors, the destroyed cities, and so on, to make us look at this and say, we can't do it. But I think the, the, what one has to then ask is, if this doesn't work, what does work? in terms of slowing down brutality, horror, war, disease, and so on. So a few years ago, when uh, the military policeman codenamed Cesar smuggled out a USB stick from prison to show 11,000 Syrian young men, all of them tortured and killed, the cause of death being put as breathing problems or heart problems, which is quite unusual for men in their 20s, the world barely responded. These were checked forensically. There were 55,000 photographs, but there's very, very little response. The world did not intervene to stop the brutality. So again, the question is, what does one do? How does one do it differently? Bloomberg and Shannarin, the day that nobody died, they went with the British troops in Afghanistan embedded but they re be, refuse to be part of a system of what I can photograph, what I can't photograph being checked by sensors. So they simply had the troops carry for them their paper in rolls and they unrolled it, exposed it to the light. And this was their form of resistance to not wanting to be part of the war effort. So I was involved with this program, a project started by the Daylight Foundation. It was giving uh, 10 disposable cameras to Iraqi civilians a year after the US invasion, and they were distributed. I always say, and when I give these talks, that the picture of an Iraqi person going to the dentist is the most important picture for me from the Iraqi war, because it shows the normalcy of the people instead of the tendency and imagery to always show the explosions and the horror. These people must be crazy. But they go to the dentist just like us. They are like us. They're not crazy. And maybe it's easier for us to look at it as a kind of spectacle of chaos. But I think it's important also for photographers to show something of the normalcy, of the everyday, of the real people. This. Uh, probably cost two, $300 the entire project to do. And we did an exhibition of it at New York University in New York. CNN picked it up. And I think it was something like six or seven minutes on CNN that they showed the photographs. It's something they didn't think to do, but we thought to do, and it was cheap. It was a way of saying there's something else going on that we're not looking at. 
This, uh, by Isa Tuma in Syria, the women we have not yet lost. These are young Syrian women who gathered in an art gallery, his art gallery during a bombing, the bombing in Aleppo. And, you know, this is people who are alive, but may not be. He covered their eyes. Um, you don't really see their IDs. He interviews them and he asks them about their hopes. You know, these are people who, ha who want to have a future. And instead of the typical of photographing the death and destruction, he's saying we should not be losing these people. We have to work proactively, not just reactively. Or this by Monica Haller, these are 50 books that she did. Riley and his story is the first one. It's somebody she went to university with. He was a medic at Abu Ghraib in Iraq who, who just wanted to come back from the war normal. He, he was traumatized. He lost some of his memory. He lost some of his hard drive, but she helped him make a book so that when you see what actually happened in terms of trauma, there's a logic to it. You could reconstitute your memory. It's not buried in the same way. And so it could be helpful. So the idea of these 50 books with civilians, with parents, families, veterans, using photography that they made to make books with them, including their text, which could be helpful therapeutically, again, becomes a kind of a proactive peace photography as opposed to a more typical war photography. And then I think it's also important that we don't fall for the way things are staged for us, the, you know, just to make it look really kind of exciting. This was the US invasion of Haiti in 1994, bring Aristide to power, you know, said to be for democracy. And this is what we saw in the press, but this is actually what it looked like from the side. I think there were 13 photographers there. So my suggestion is if we're running a picture like this, that we do a rollover, it's online, it's digital, you could put a picture under it and you show people what it actually looked like from the side so that we just don't have a kind of World War II drama, you know, the Americans coming for democracy and liberty, but what's really happening. When I showed this a World Press photo, I think it was um, just around that time when this photograph was made. Uh, I was heavily criticized by the two, two of the photographers there who, who thought it was wrong of me to actually reveal what was going on. I think it's important that the reader know what's going on, you know, whether it's a press conference, a photo opportunity, a staged opportunity, a, a head of a country putting his arm around the factory workers if they'd known each other forever when in fact it was staged, maybe it was air conditioned, it was lit, just to give people a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. Similarly, there was a hashtag in the United States, if they gunned me down by young African-American men and women, if the police gunned them down, th this is the kind of image the police would potentially run, the, or media would potentially run about it to make it look like they're gangsters. And they wanted to be clear that there are other images of them and they would prefer this image, not the other one that confirms what they're supposed to be, but who they are. So again, if one is running, publishing this image, I would do a rollover and show this image because I think it's unfair to people to just depict them according to the stereotype of what, you know, what somebody wants them to be as opposed to who they are, which is obviously what a lot about George Floyd has is, is emerged. Who is this person? Who was this person? Why don't we know these things as opposed to just categorizing them as a certain subgroup who, who somehow in media plays a role, often undeserved? Or this is uh, by one of the students in the uh, photography and social justice program uh, that I'm teaching now. Uh, and this is what we did in class. The idea you could do is a self-portrait and then you could do a rollover which says something different. And I think this is really an important image because it's saying, here I am with my husband, here we are, but this is what it's like to live right now in the United States. Or this one, which is a, uh, a hashtag, my last shot, 
done by, in Colorado by high school young women who decided to put stickers on their cell phones and identity cards. And if they were killed in a school shooting, they were giving permission to photographers to show their dead bodies because they did not want to die in vain. They wanted to be shown. Um, you know, they don't, they're sick of yellow police tape and police cars and not being able to see the violence. They don't want to go to school every day being afraid of violence. And they want to be able to say, you have the right to show my picture. I want you to show my picture. It's important. Or this uh, question bridge, this was done by uh, African-American men with African-American men asking each other questions and answering their questions. So it becomes a way of not the journalists asking the question, but people asking each other the question. And it's five screens and it what goes like this. Word that we can remember you by as a black man. When your last day on this earth, what is the last, what is the word, a word that we can remember you by? On the last word as a black man that I would like to be remembered by is warrior. Sincere. Motivated. Dedicated. Proper balance. Family oriented. Honesty. And as a student of Baha'u'llah, he's seen the light and changed. Creative. Because if you don't know, man, I'm the creator. Thoughtful. Responsibility. Empowerment. Getting students artists. Father, I think is the greatest thing a black man can be, father. So again, I think in terms of what we're seeing in the country, in the US, around the world, Black Lives Matter, that these are things that professional photographers, media people can be doing and doing differently to explore and to help us understand different groups of people, different issues, what's going on in the world. You know, I think the, the model that they used for question bridge that they, I just showed you was intended for other people to use as well so that people can understand each other, ask each other questions and answer them. And this is Oscar Castillo, another student in the class. We do interactive portraits in the class. So one of the ideas you could do digitally is you can make a portrait of somebody else and then you could turn your camera around or make a print and show it to the person and say, is this you? Does this photograph portrait represent you or not? If you're a homeless person, if you're a refugee, if you're somebody's father, whoever you are, tell me and then we'll include it, your response. So the reader, if they want to, could find out, is this who you are? So I'll, I'll, I'll show you how it works here. Me vi exactamente representado como es mi sentir, como es mi relación con la naturaleza, de ese verdor, de la descomposición del color, del amarillo al marrón, me vi por todo el tránsito de mi vida y todo, todos los momentos por lo que he pasado que nunca están ni estarán desligados de lo que es el ciclo de la naturaleza. Ese ciclo de la vida que nos nutre, que nos, nos mantiene y de alguna manera también nos va degradando. So we do, you know, many, with many different people over the years that, that those attempts. This is something I published from Robert Knoth and Tornat Jung from Holland. And this is also the idea of engaging the reader differently because this is a photo essay that we published on Pixel Press of the effect of nuclear radiation, accidents, uh, above ground testing on people. There are no captions. And the way to find a caption is you have to roll over with the cursor, the reader, which engages the reader. And then you start to see the captions when you do this. This guy, 16, I don't like to go to school because the boys call me bad names. The girls avoid me, don't wanna go out with me. I hope I will not have children who look like me. But to, to get it, you have to ask the question, who are the people? You know, who are they? What are they about? We're not gonna tell you. Often in photography, the caption people read it and they don't even have to look at the picture anymore. 
The point of photography is look at the picture, feel it, and then find out. And this is stuff that you can do online easily, but hardly anybody ever does things like this. Sometimes they do. These are twin brothers, 16. Michael with hydrocephalus is five minutes older than Vladimir, who is deaf. And again, the hydrocephalus is much is more frequent in areas where people have been exposed to a lot of radiation. We, with the week we published this in 2005, we got half a million viewers, which made it bigger than Vanity Fair um, in terms of readership. And this was done by students. It was edited by students, done by a professional photographer and writer and designer. But it was an attempt to open a dialogue uh, about what does radiation do? And, the, for, you know, and in some cases, the governor of one of the former parts of the Soviet Union decided not to build a nuclear reactor after seeing these images. It has impact. It does something. These, these uh, they would collect the milk. And if there's a fly or dirt, they'd get it out. If the milk was radioactive, they would add some so-called good milk until the radiation levels went down enough that it would be considered acceptable. Where this is Gideon Mendel's work, there was a very racist idea by Western governments, NGOs, not to provide antiretroviral uh, to people in, in Africa uh, who are HIV positive because of this horrible idea racist idea that they would not take the medicine, they wouldn't be disciplined. So Gideon, who's originally from South Africa, went over four years to a pilot project to see what happened. This woman was near death at the time, and he followed her as she took the medicine. And four years later, this is the way she was with her children. And I have this email, I asked UN AIDS, what was the impact? I think it would be not too bold to say that this work helped us reach 8 million people who are on treatment today. And I think it's pretty damn good that somebody's work can help 8 million people to be healthy. Uh, this is not the work that wins the prizes. This is not the work of the spectacle, the disease, the disaster. This is proactive, again, peace photography, not waiting for the apocalypse, but trying to do it before. And just two or three more examples, you know, as I'm ending up here, this is one of the only iconic photographs of the 21st century. You know, it's my opinion that it's in the 21st century, it's very rare to have an iconic photograph. It's more frequent with videos at this point, less with photographs. But this of Alan Kurdi, the three year old uh, Syrian boy who drowned, trying to escape with his family. And this is what we saw, and it's been credited with 30,000 uh, refugees being allowed into Canada and, and you know, many, many other changes, uh, you know, helpful to, the, to, to refugees. So one of the things that I've worked on for a long time and is now available, it's called the Four Corners Project, which allows you or anybody to, in each of the corners, to put certain information that provides context, the bottom right, would be the credit, the caption. And you could also put, and it's, I encourage you to put your code of ethics. You know, I do not manipulate photographs. You know, whatever it would be, or I'm a fashion photographer, I don't work with underweight, unhealthy models, whatever it would be. So I wrote a code of ethics for the photographer. I did this, uh, you know, as she, she, has, she doesn't know about this, presumably, well, photography is interpretive. As a photojournalist, my photographs are meant to respect the visible facts of the situations I depict. I do not add or subtract elements to or from my photograph. This is a backstory. The bottom left corner is a backstory, what was going on around it. The upper left is, 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 the, is related imagery, the image context. And so I think it's really important to see him and his brother. I mean, to me, photo, publishing the photograph by itself, to me, doesn't give the impact of this is a child with a family. We have to imagine that in that case, I think this makes it really difficult to look away. And then on, on the upper right would be links, you know, to, to, for example, a human rights watch, why it's okay to share this image ethically, you know, other things. Um, and so the codes of ethics, you know, you could write your own or put these in. Um, 
It works authorship, backstory, related imagery, links, it's all explained. And if you go to this website, fourcornersproject.org, it's open source, it's free, anybody could use it. And, um, you know, there's a group of people, uh, Corey Tegler and others, he, he did the programming, it's open source and free. And I just end up with two ideas. Um, Photodemic is a publication that was started two months ago on Earth Day by former students uh, from the International Center of Photography, where I was the dean. And it's, you know, publishing all kinds of work by different people from around the world. Uh, this coming Wednesday, they're sponsoring a town hall to discuss issues of race and photography, infrastructures, how do you make the world a better place? You know, what can you do? It's photodemic.org. And I think it's really important that the younger generation not only makes important imagery, but also constructs platforms to show it. You know, not just Instagram, not just Facebook, but uh, platforms that are, they have many, many people's work together that if you come looking for something about Tokyo, you end up looking at something about the US. And if you're looking at the US, you end up in Georgia. You know, you end up in different places with different ideas. So you can check out photodemic.org, they accept um submissions from people and and you know different right writing as well video photography okay and now just to end up this is the last idea um on zoom today which i must tell you talking to my own computer is an interesting experience um I just want to go back to 1943. This, this was kind of revolutionary. This was a magazine that reached millions of people for 10 cents. And they said people are dying. And it's important that we pay attention. They ran the names in the first 18 months of the war of almost 13,000 soldiers, where they come from, their age, their rank. We don't do that today in most cases. Some cases with the COVID virus, we do it, but in many cases we don't. But in that same issue in 1943, I happened to find this, I think it was eight pages, Race War in Detroit. There's a local newspaper photographer on the left who's being chased by the gang of, of white young people who at that point are beating up the African-Americans, men, on the street and it says Americans maul and murder each other as Hitler wins a battle in the nation's most explosive city. There is somewhere in the article it says in certain factories for the war effort, 90% of the people did not show up because of what was going on. This is what it looked like. It looked horrible. This is 1943, so this is 77 years ago. It's horrific. And then Jim Wilson just yesterday over the weekend in the New York Times covered in the protests and demonstrations in, 2000, in 1992 in Los Angeles after the verdict on Ron, Rodney King that the police officers who horribly beat him were viewed not guilty and he compared it to what he's photographing now after the killing of George Floyd. So on the left is 1992 and on the right is current, both by Jim Wilson, a New York Times staff photographer. So I just want to end with the idea that, you know, photographers, all of us, we, we tend to look at what's visible. We tend to look at the symptoms to what emerges, but we often repeat the same images. We often repeat the same ideas. We have to, because often the same things happen. But I think of all times in the world, after a digital revolution, with all the tools we have, with all the platforms we have, with all the strategies we have, with how cheap it is now to make imagery, we don't pay for big film costs and printing costs and so on and so forth. I think it's really, really important that we rededicate ourselves to new ways, new strategies of going underneath what's going on, looking at the structures which cause racism, which cause certain people to stay poor, which cause certain people to be unhealthy, certain people to be refugees, and we expose them. There's no guarantee that each time we do it, the world will be a better place, but we have to keep trying. And if enough of us try, 
My sense is that eventually we will win. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Don't worry, you are not only talking to your computer, but we are all listening. Um, and we already had quite a few reactions in the chat and also in the Q&A box. And actually, I would start with one question, which maybe kind of came into my own head, um, because I was uh, thinking about uh, the author and what is with the position of the author, because all the many of the um, projects or images you showed to us, they don't really focus on this idea of the author. And I would read a question we have in the uh, Q&A box by Tim, and he's asking, isn't it rather a problem of the mainstream media showing these forms of presenting a topic creatively, like in all your examples, than the lack of photographers, authors out there creating this work? In others of your talks, you state that mainstream photography media is getting less and less important. For me, it is interesting how we use our power as authors and the new media forms, socials, to get these works out there. How we can better reach all the cell phones out there. So maybe it's interesting to start with that. Okay, I mean, if you look at photo books that are being published, it's definitely a renaissance. There's such an incredible diversity and variety of forms. It's never happened before. You could say that we used to have books of photographs, which are kind of compendiums or portfolios, but now we have more and more a sense of individuality, authorship, idiosyncrasy, trying new things. You know, we've had books on the torture at Guantanamo Bay. We've had books on Monsanto and, and the chemical poisoning of the world as well as very personal books as well. So I think there are many, many forms that people are working with. What I was trying to do in showing older mainstream media, 1943, 1969, and so on, was to say, what kind of strategies did they use visually to have an impact? And again, by showing the war dead in Vietnam in one week, 242 people, just showing them as ID photographs, identity photographs, it had more impact for many than just continuing to show the same kinds of imagery of war and conflict. So I think one of the things we have to look at is visual strategies. Yeah. One of the problems that we have on social media is that many people are used to clicking or, or swiping away uh, let's say on Instagram, almost immediately, if an image, they don't necessarily uh, focus on it, they swipe it away, they get rid of it. And I think there are many images that are difficult to show that way. I would have trouble showing a photograph of the liberation of a concentration camp on Instagram with all the emaciated people, with the people dead. Somehow, it, it doesn't have enough respect for it. So what I'm arguing for is that to use Instagram, to use social media, but there are two issues there. One is how do you also create syn synergy, like platforms that represent photographers from many, many countries around the world. When we started Photodemic, we had 11 people in the Zoom chat, and I saw that they represented five continents, which I was very happy about. But with all, for example, the students and, and students who graduated, you know, in Hanover, you know, where I teach, all over the world, why don't we have consortiums, confederations, alliances of people trying to pool their images to make a bigger impact? You can show racism in 12 countries, you could show racism in six countries, you could do you could do things together and then it gets picked up by other kinds of media, just the way CNN picked us up on the Iraqi civilians. So I agree that mainstream media is not the only focus at all. That has to be all over the place. Sometimes one thing I didn't show was Clouds Over Cedra. It was a virtual reality piece and it was aimed for wealthy people in Kuwait to help Syrian refugees. And supposedly by, by making one virtual reality piece by the UN, they raised $1.6 billion more than they would have. So I'm very happy there were very few people in the room, but they gave $1.6 billion more than they would have. 
to be helpful there. And I think the other issue is tribalism. I think it's really important that we're not in tribes. We just don't look at what um, we agree upon or what we know upon. The reason I showed you photodemic the way I did was, you know, I found out about Japan and Georgia and the US in those three examples. The, if I go there for one thing, I found out about other things. You know, that's the old idea of a front page. So that I think, you know, you bring somebody in, maybe it's about sports, and then you show them something about race, um, you know, in the same in the same context. So I think we have to do a better job about thinking this through. I think we have an awful lot of photographers and image makers. Going back to Karen's very gracious in, uh, introduction, I think we need more meta photographers, you know, people who figure out what to do with these images, how to find the images on social media that we should be looking at. Um, and I think that's critical. If I wanted to know about race in 30 countries, I would love there to be university or high school students in 30 countries telling me what to look at on social media. I don't have time or the language skills to, to, to look at 30 countries. I, I think we could do more with what's already available. There's trillions of images online of which we know very, very, very few. And for the most part, we, we're doing a really bad job at getting it out to the general public. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, listening to you, I was asking myself maybe um, that the, um, the work field of a photographer now becomes more and more complex, needs many more skills. And so you might take the conclusion that um, it's not a one man or one woman show anymore, but it needs more complex working conditions, collaborations with other people. Would you agree on that? I think the key thing is the word you use, that photographers need to look at themselves as authors of the image. They're not suppliers of imagery to somebody else to select, to caption, to contextualize, to lay out. I think as much as possible, photographers, just like writers, filmmakers, and so on, should be thinking of themselves as authors. It's not F8 and be there. It's not the camera does the work. It's the photographer who is in interpretive and the photographer who needs to think of themselves as author, and I think editors have to more and more respect the authorship of the photographer. But to be an effective author, you need to know what you're photographing. You need to know what you're looking at. You know, if I arrived in, in Tokyo, having never been there, I would not start making images and say, this is Tokyo. If I did make images and I did publish them, I would say I arrived 24 hours before, I don't really know what I'm looking at, but here's a few ideas. And I welcome the audience, the readers, to add their interpretations as well. You know, we can't pretend that we land in a situation and within minutes we're experts, we're making photographs of it. That's an old model that doesn't work, which is why a lot of people now privilege the local photographer who knows what they're seeing versus the outsider. To me, the ideal is outsider and insider both work. You know, the Robert Frank Americans, the outsider idea that both work. But I do agree, Karen, with what you just said, that I think photographers ideally become visual journalists. If you're working in the journalist field, you're not just a photojournalist, you're a visual journalist, which requires, you know, different skill sets but also, you know, really a kind of willingness to experiment. If you're taking a portrait of somebody, what does that mean? You meet them five minutes before, I took your portrait. Well, is that them? How do you know? You know, so many photographers don't want to be photographed themselves in part because they know it's aggressive. Somebody takes their portrait, but is that them? Nobody asked them. So the interactive portrait was one idea, Four Corners was an, uh, another idea. You know, there are many, many ideas of things you could do digitally, you know, hybrid of, of video and photography, so on and so forth, you know, that you could do to begin to open it up into real authorship, saying different things and not just doing, you know, here's one hundredth of a second. I'll just say what I've often said when I was a curator on a, a Magnum photo show, 40 years of history with 400 photographs, enormous show. But I realized if it was 400 photographs at a hundredth of a second, I was showing four seconds of history. That was not very much, one second every 10 years. And I think authorship is different where there's context, you know, where you provide 
the text around it. Maybe there's a video behind it. Maybe there's a rollover behind it. So you see the person at work, the person at home, you know, you're doing more than what, what, what is normally done. I, I think there are many, many ways to do it. A digital revolution is not a revolution in technology only. If it is, it's not a revolution. It's just a consumerism. I think it has to be a revolution in thinking about what we're doing on thinking differently and expanding it. And yes, the onus is on us in the community to do it differently. I think it's, it's taking a very long time for people to realize that we are living in a revolution. Um, thinking about the dig digital revolution, um, maybe it's also interesting to think about new techniques as well, because I think all these techniques always have an influence also on the content they are showing. And if you maybe, um, think about immersive technologies, um, uh, three, uh, 360 degrees media, um, then somehow um, you go away, I think, from this idea of the big authorship and you kind of include the readers a lot and give a lot of control to them. Um, you, I once heard you talking about um, Roland Barthes' idea of the active reader, which might come or get some importance in this. And I think if you, in, for, for example, immersive media, um, go away from the frame or you lose the frame, you lose this control. And I would be interested how you would elaborate on this. What kind of consequences has it on the idea of authorship? Enormous consequences. Um, you're right, enormous consequences. I worked on a project with Al Jazeera, AJ Contrast, um, called Still Here. It was women of color who've been imprisoned in the United States and what, what happens after their release. And the way we did it, um, it the, the, the woman in charge was Zara Rasul. They organized a virtual reality piece. They interviewed many women who had been incarcerated and they created a fictional character. And you went into virtual reality. There were, it was shown at Sundance Festival in the US. There were two headsets so two people could do it at once and you're inside the situation. Then there was an augmented reality piece um, where you could walk up and down and see how Harlem where they live uh, has changed over the decades. It became gentrified, different people moved in, richer people moved in, it was hard to move back, they couldn't afford rents and so on. And then I curated the photo exhibition that went with it and statistics. And I was amazed for example, to find out that the US has only 4% of the women in the world, but over 30% of women behind bars in prison in the world are in the US, that Rikers Island, the jail in New York, it costs for every prisoner over $200,000 a year to keep everybody, each prisoner behind bars. It's probably about 500 euros every night per prisoner, which is more than a four-star hotel. You know, there were many, many things that were amazing, extraordinary. So what we did was we combined the statistics to ground it, to make it concrete. The photo exhibition was one photographer followed five different women, you know, who'd been incarcerated and got out on their jobs, you know, the problems they've had, the successes they've had. And then we ran Google aerial satellite views in the US, we have more prisons, jails, and detention centers than we have colleges and universities, over 5,000. And we ran a, a, a good section of aerial views of the prisons, jails, detention centers um, there. So I think that by combining the virtual reality, which only two people at a time could see, the photography where what was important, you could see it and talk to the person next to you about it, that's terrible. You know, people start crying. What do you feel? I have a relative in prison. Why don't we do something about it? And the statistics and the augmented reality, we combine them all, you know, to try to do something using multimedia to do it differently. I don't think there's any one medium is better than any other. I think they're all different and interesting. What I like about photography is I want to see how the photographer interprets the situation. And then as a reader, I'll use my own judgment my own experience to interpret it myself. You know, about going back to Barth and the active reader, I think the problem with 360 and, and so on and so forth, they can get very gimmicky and gadgety and like a game, 
and sometimes they could be really important too. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, um, combinations of the various strategies make the most sense. But I think what at the end of the day, what's important is to have an impact, is to have people come away from it and say, well, you know, this is, I understand it. And in, in some cases to feel I'm gonna do something about it and change it. it. Photography can't be voyeuristic where you're just watching. It has to be something, you know, where you, where you, you feel it, you know, maybe you vote differently, maybe you speak differently, maybe you eat differently. If you see a, a photo essay on, on the slaughter of animals, maybe you become a vegetarian. I don't know, you, you make your choices. But I think we have to try everything and I can't, I don't think we can prejudge things and say, this is bad, this is good, before we try it in many ways and see, in fact, you know, what its impact. You know, I always stand there at these exhibitions. Yes, people after virtual reality were crying. You know, two of the women came who were incarcerated. They were very moved by the virtual reality. They were also very moved by the photography. They were also very moved by the aerial views, you know, and so on. So I, I think it's important to try it to find out how people respond. Obviously in different countries, people may respond differently. You know, Different people may respond differently from each other, but keep trying it and be open to it and view this as a renaissance of possibilities. And yes, the responsibility is on all of us to try and move it forward. Yes, we don't have enough money to do it. Yes, people are not open often to give assignments to do these things. But finally, to do an interactive portrait is no more expensive than doing a regular portrait. You just turn the camera around and record the person's voice. That's not expensive. Many of these things are not about expense. They're just about willingness to try stuff. For me, it sounds like it's important to use um, more complex strategies and to combine strategies. Um, I therefore have a very easy question, actually. Um, we had um, Kai Misebeck, Head of Innovation um, for Arte TV in, uh, in our Lumix podcast. And he said, um, being um, asked, what is a good story? A good story can be put into one sentence. Would you agree on that? No, not at all. What is a good story about racism in the United States? It's about healthcare, it's about education, it's about incarceration, it's about police, it's about people coming from many countries, immigrant populations, it's about a legacy of, of slavery in the United States, it's about many, 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 many things. So we have what's called the elevator pitch where you, you know, tell somebody in an elevator in one sentence what you think it should be, but I, I, I think, you know, yes, you can do that. You can get people interested. But I think what we need is more complexity. I, I still don't know what happened in Wuhan in China where the COVID virus first emerged. How did they deal with it? What are the repercussions? Have people recovered? What about families? Are there more divorces? Are there less divorces? Do people fall in love more often, less often? Do they watch different things on television? Are they playing football again? I don't know any of these things. So, you know, I, I, I think that we have millions or thousands of pictures of people in masks, which tell us nothing. I don't need to see one more picture of a person in a mask, but I do need to see what the impact is, of all this is on people in so many different ways. And, you know, in China, in Germany, in the US, why, you know, why are so many women heads of governments responsible for countries that have done relatively well in terms of dealing with the virus? You know, I'm interested. What are the reasons? Well, how is Germany different than the US, Iceland, New Zealand? I want to know all these things because I think we all have to learn from each other. And I think the problem often is that Western countries think that they know it and non-Western countries don't. And I think it's often the opposite is true that we don't learn from each other. So we put Chinese people into masks and say, oh, we're better than them. And now we're wearing masks. You know, and I think, I, I think we have to challenge the assumptions in which we do things. So to say one sentence, to me, doesn't sufficiently challenge the assumptions that we're making in much of the journalism that we do. And, and obviously, you know, we, we need to learn. We don't know very much about our world. You could argue the opposite is true, that in globalization, the internet, in many ways, we know less about each other than before. In some ways, we know more, at least about certain people. I know in the United States, if I went to you know, certain states in this country, I would feel I know less about them than ever 
I just don't know anything. I don't know why people are that way. I don't understand it. And nobody's telling me in any kind of in-depth way. So I think there's a lot for us to do. And I think it's a restart for what we do. And therefore, that's why one sentence makes me nervous because I would settle for about two paragraphs. I, I would settle for two paragraphs. Okay, thank you. I would turn to some of the questions in the chat box. And there's one question referring to the um, Four Corners project. Um, uh, and this person was wondering how successful uh, the Four Corners project has been so far. Well, just to show how this works, I, I suggested it. I gave the keynote speech at World Press Photo in 2004, which is 16 years ago. You know, I got like a standing ovation, wonderful. And it was, nobody helped, no major media, no minor media, nobody basically until 2018 did anything with the idea. You know, to me, it was always open source. I never wanted to own it. I, I just wanted to be helpful because I always felt it's kind of ridiculous that we've made so little progress since the caption in contextualizing imagery. So in 2018, you know, with former students, uh, you know, a programmer, you know, we and, and a tiny little grant from the Open Source uh, Open Society Foundation, you know, we, we, I mean, a modest grant, we did it. Again, media organizations don't pick it up. A lot of, from what I understand, students have been using it, young people have been using it. Um, in Norway now, they've just set up a committee to advance it in Norway. Um, you know, they're different tries, but I, I think, again, there's a resistance to change, a resistance to experimentation. Um, you know, that, that this field is very, very conservative that we're in, and people like to go out and make pictures, but beyond that, I, I, you know, the, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, um, and we're not very community oriented in many ways in doing it. So yes, it's there, it's being used more often, but it is not taking over the world of photography in any way, that's fine. Then if you ask the same question about rollovers, I've been using them for so many years, decades now, and you still don't see them in important ways. You know, a president of a country gives a speech, everything is wonderful, do a rollover. Under the rollover you show it's not wonderful. You know, there are many, you know, it was done in 1930s by Hartfield uh, with the collages against uh, uh, the, the, the Nazi party. Um, you know, Joseph Renau, there are different people who've used it in collage form. So no, it's, it's we still, you know, are not very experimental um, in terms of what we're doing, uh, you know, in general. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um for the audience, if you have more questions, go ahead and put them into the chat box. Um, I would um, just stay with the Four Corners project uh, a little while, and because I myself was always wondering, I, I really like the idea of putting with this kind of system um, one image into a context and always to publish it with this kind of context. But I was asking myself if this somehow gives the idea, this is the image with the context, but we all know that the meaning of an image is changing with every new context. So the whole system will never be finished actually, but you somehow you would have to refresh the four corners or some of the corners nearly all the time. No, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think like what I showed you before with the death of Alan Kurdi, the Syrian, three-year-old boy, you know, if there's a backstory, the photographer explaining what happened at the time, how she felt about it. You know, she, she didn't like having to make that picture. It, 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 it was very difficult for her to do, you know, the, the related imagery on the upper left corner, him and his brother. I think that's important to be with the image that Aileen Curdy in our memory had a brother, he had a stuffed animal, he had a family, he was loved. I think that always would stay with it. I think the bottom right corner, the caption, the code of ethics could always stay with the image and the upper right corner, the links could always stay with it as well. So I think, yes, you know, there are ways like you could do a wiki kind of thing if one wanted where people could make comments over time and, and, and so on. What we were trying to do and are trying to do with the Four Corners is establish 
Like I know a lot about this field, but I am often surprised to find out the backstory of an image. You know, the, you know, some of the very famous images, I don't know what happened. And sometimes I really even want to know what happened afterwards. Did the person survive? If they did survive, what did they become? Um, you know, many, many, many things around it. So I'm just suggesting that it made sense in 1839 when photography began for it to be a single image. There you go. That's wonderful. That's amazing. And I'm suggesting in certain cases, I always hoped that fourth corner would be used about 1% of the time, half a percent of the time for important images to tell us that what we're looking at is really not exactly the way it was. Something else happened and nothing will ever you know, completely contextualize everything, like you said, will evolve. We all will have different opinions, but it's a lot more than simply saying, you know, here's an image, do whatever you want to do with it. Because what we're finding now is the same image is being used by people to so-called prove anything they want or is manipulated, or they don't know if it's credible. And then going back, uh, you know, I, I personally don't know if in five or 10 years, more and more people will be doing what I showed of making computer generated or artificial intelligence imagery to stand for a scene because there's privacy issues, because the image is incredible anyway, you know, and so on and so forth. I really don't want us to get to the point where we lose photography as a reference point because it's, it's you know, I go back to Doctors Without Borders, you know, Kushner, one of the founders of, you know, Doctors Without Borders said that in uh, Biafra, you know, they, they couldn't, use an eyewitness testimony because people would not believe that person because they were supposedly subjective. So they needed a photograph to prove a massacre. And for a long time, I've said, if we don't believe photographs, there are no massacres because nobody will believe them anymore. You know, my side against your side, we're all subjective now. There's nothing that's viewed as fair and credible, not objective, but fair and credible. And you know what, what John Berger called a quotation from appearances. It's a quotation, a visual quotation from appearances. And I think we're in danger of losing that. And I don't think we're doing enough as a field to try to preserve that. So again, it's a long answer to a short question, but you know, these are things we really have to think a lot about is how do we preserve what's left of the credibility of the photograph? You know, do we publish a code of ethics with it when we make our image so people know individually what our code of ethics is. I would never change an image or whatever it would be. Um, you know, and I think, you know, there's a lot to be said for that, especially on social media with a, you know, code of ethics is it whatever you want to make it. And also in many newspapers and magazines, it's similar at this point. Yeah, I would agree completely that with the four corners and this information about the brother of Ailan Kurdi, um, you, he stays an individual with a special story, history um, on his own, and he doesn't, which is maybe one of the characteristics of iconic images, he um, doesn't get a representation for a more abstract thing or for a whole idea, but it's also him as a person. Um, I was wondering why, why for you, it is still an iconic image. Why is this um, image of Ailan Kori uh, different than many of the other images um, we, we work with nowadays? I'm gonna answer the first part and then the second part. I, when I said to Berger, you know, if you photograph the person with their own family, it's different than photographing for the outside world. And I think in this case, in the four corners or a rollover, seeing him and his brother and the stuffed animal, it's the family album. He's part of a family. He's not a generic symbol for brutality, atrocity, and horror. He's a boy. He has his own individual history. We don't have the right to co-opt it to stand for whatever we want to stand for without also acknowledging who this person is. Because I think there's one of the issues that you have to think about is re-victimizing people. When people suffer horror, people are traumatized, the survivors. Seeing an image over and over and over again of George Floyd uh, dead on the ground, that's why I cropped the image not to see his face. I don't think it's right to show his face over and over and over again. It's not correct to his family, to his friends to the intimate people who then have to suffer the death each time they see it. 
why that image worked iconically at the time, a lot of people have asked that question. And I think what the answer that makes the most sense to me is that people could empathize and say, look at the shoes he's wearing, look at the way he's dressed. He looks just like my own child when I dress my child for school. This should not have happened. People were able to empathize as opposed to showing, you know, other images that we've seen of Syria, you know, of a child, you know, who, who suffered a bomb blast, who's very highly wounded. You know, people often just want to get the image away from them and not have to deal with it. So I think to a certain extent, you know, media climates change. Um, you know, I think in 1972, when Nick Utz's photograph of the girl being napalmed in Vietnam was published, the uh, wire surface did not want to publish it at first because it was obscene to show a nude child, especially in Asia at that time, a girl, and they did publish it and it became iconic. And I think recently in the last 15 years, the almost the only pictures that ever emerged at least it's semi-iconic, are children. That they're the only ones, we, you know, the, the girl in, uh, from Honduras crying with her mother at the US border as the mother is interrogated by the police, the security people. It's, it's often children. And I think that's, you know, that's problematic. We don't have the same empathy for adults. Um, and I think we also overuse the visual vocabulary, which is why, you know, I point to blue skies, I point to different ideas. Um, you know, of ways of trying to get at it. Many people have been doing things like photographing people's shoes of refugees, you know, doing it in different ways. So it's a different kind of image. But I think at the end of the day, finally, it also is the platform. We don't have a front page, you know, that lasts for a week, like a printed magazine or a day, like a newspaper that we all see and talk about in a train or a bus. You know, we're all on our earbuds, we're all on cell phones. The images are tiny. As I said, we flip them away. And that image, you know, is one of the rare ones that got through. You cannot predict what's going to be iconic. You could just keep making images, but knowing that the chance of it being iconic are very low, and one has to come up with other strategies as well. And if it is iconic, it will often be a bystander with a cell phone and not a professional photographer, because there are very few professional photographers compared to bystanders with cell phones. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I turn to um, one more question from the chat box. There are also a lot of answers about the names of the photographers from the projects you've shown us. We go to that at the end, maybe. Um, I take this question. There's a need for contrasting meta photographers to the classical photographers, but what are the meta viewers? Are we giving the tools to the public to be as well as active as these meta photographers? If so, which are the best evidences to it in a post-factual era? You see it also in the um, chat box if you'd like to read it again. No, no, it's, it's fine, thank you. <laughs> um, I think we're doing a terrible job of teaching media literacy in schools in many countries, not all countries, but many countries. I think we have an idea that if you teach people how to read words, it's sufficient, but we don't teach them often how to read media, how to interpret media, how to understand it for the most part. And that's one issue. But I think that media has typically assumed that readers are not very smart, have assumed that readers don't have much autonomy or their own ideas. And, I, you know, in, in New York, they used to say that a certain newspaper was written for people with third grade education, which is like an eight year old, certain people for fifth grade, like a 10 year old and certain people, you know, maybe ninth grade or eighth grade like a 14 year old. And I think a, a lot of people are a lot smarter than that. Um, and I think the issue is not always the mass. You're not always trying to reach 12 million people. You may be trying to reach 120 people who are very smart, whose lives will change because of it, who will do things differently because of that. And, you know, I think it's our obligation. I once gave a, a talk. We did a project on East Harlem in New York. It's being gentrified. And I showed it at National Geographic, their annual conference for the book division. And we help people keep their apartments, not get kicked out by the wealthier people moving in, the landlords. And we were very proud of it. And somebody in the audience, a National Geographic photographer said, if you don't reach 1 million people, it's not worth doing. 
I don't agree at all with that. I think you know we could reach whoever. Um, in many, many ways, we could reach people. But I think a lot of the things that I'm suggesting, like interactive portraits, for example, rollovers, are simple to do. People get it. It's not hard. I mean, after the U.S. and the um, the September 11th attacks in New York, I did a, a two pictures next to each other. Um, one of uh, Afghanistan destroyed and one of New York City destroyed. The similar, the pictures were very similar. And I said, why are we going to go bomb Afghanistan if they've already been bombed? What's the point? People got it. I mean, we had huge readership. People understood it. Um, it's not that hard to do. In the 1930s, people understood John Hartfield. But we've gone away from, you know, that kind of more inventive stuff. I, I highly recommend actually looking at the picture magazines in the 1920s and 30s have a much more sophisticated media literacy, visual literacy than we have now in what we're doing. So I don't think that's an excuse not to do stuff. Yes, we have to educate people, but the first two or three times they try to roll over, we could explain it and then keep doing it. You know, we could teach it in schools. We should be teaching it in universities, you know, these new techniques and they should be spread, you know, around by many people who become, you know, teachers themselves or on websites. So I, I'm, you know, in general, what I'm saying is we have an obligation to community. My problem is not whether photography survives. My problem is whether we can be useful to the world as we go forward using photography. Now I'm sure photography will survive. There'll always be beautiful pictures, amazing pictures. There's no question, but I'm worried about its usefulness, its credibility, its authenticity, its impact on the world, not just, you know, is this a good picture or not a good picture? Different criteria. I would love to see the Peace Photography Prize more extensive, given more often. You know, who helped peace? Not just the best war photography, peace photography. I'd love to see histories of photography, of peace photography, not just of war photography. I'd like us to change the way we think, not to shoot pictures, not to take pictures and change generally. Everything I'm saying fits under that rubric, that set of ideas. I don't take responsibility for moving everything forward. I do my best, but I think we all have to take responsibility. And by the way, just to, before I forget, I'm coming out with a new website called The Fifth Corner, Karen, just off your question, uh, which will you know have all kinds of projects and writings and different ways of doing things, which I hope to have up in about the next month or so. Um, the fifth corner .org, uh, you know, just as a resource for people to use with some of these ideas and, and use it whatever way you want to use it. But, uh, you know, I think we all have to be inventing stuff, doing stuff differently, trying stuff, being innovative, you know, being like Jackson Pollock showing, throwing a paint can against the canvas as opposed to always using the same brushes, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Time is running fast and it feels a bit now like a convenient point to stop. I go back to the chat box because there were some questions about the names of the people who made the projects. Like what's the name of the project by Oscar Castillo, for example? Oscar Maybe. Castillo, no, that in class, we, we, when I teach, we always do interactive portraits. Right now with the Magnum Foundation, I'm teaching photography and social justice, which is a program that Susan Mizellis and I started in 2010. As part of it, a weekly assignment was do interactive portraits. So Oscar Castillo, who's from Venezuela and is, is a very accomplished uh, visual journalist is one of the people in the class. And that was, you know, all the people in the class did their own interactive portraits. So it's not part of a larger portrait, a larger project, it's, it's what he did for class assignment about a week ago in class. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, Fred, for this very interesting talk. We also have many thank yous in the chat box. So I think this be, it's been quite inspiring. Um, yeah, I say thank you to you to New York and for the audience that might be interesting to know that tomorrow we have as our topic of the day in crisis mode. So we work on images working or referring to the idea of crisis and especially um, we um, show some works um, of photographers who've been working uh, about the corona or the COVID-19 crisis right now. So um, tomorrow at four we have a live talk with Espen Rasmussen 
the Norwegian photographer. And tomorrow we also have an interview with uh, Mary Gelman um, online. And if you like to stay updated and know what kind of events we are all organizing and trying to bring to the people, maybe you apply for our newsletter or you go to our website and have a look at all the different projects, um, especially from the competition we have there um, in a digital exhibition. And thank you, Karen, and thank you to everyone for attending. Yeah. Thank you very and much. thank you to yeah. Seven, actually, because um, they made it possible for us um, to, to use their Zoom webinar platform. So they support us with this, and for this, they give you, um, for the, all the photographers among you, um, um, you can get, um, uh, um, they have a promotion code for all of you who might like to attend their workshops. Yeah, so thank you very much. Have a nice evening, and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.